Disciple of number 185, A Disciple's Identity, Part 1. This is Disciple Up, the Disciple Empowering Podcast, where psychology, science, the real world, sin, self, and culture meet head on, and scripture rules. If you're a follower of Christ looking to grow or are looking for some biblical answers, then get ready because it's time to Disciple Up. Hey, everybody, this is Disciple Up, the Disciple Empowering Podcast. Welcome aboard. Uh, welcome back. If you're a listener, regular listener, if this is your first time, welcome to the podcast. My name's Louie. I'm uh, the host for your show here, Senior Pastor at Christ Church on the River in Parker, Arizona. Glad that you're here. A um, couple of notes. This uh, will be dropping on November 11th. I'm recording it on the 9th of November, 2020. So we want to just take a second here at the very beginning, because November 11th is Veterans Day in the USA, and thank all of you veterans out there for your service, whether you served in time of peace or war, whether you were involved in combat or not, we thank you for your service because, well, first of all, service is part of a disciple's identity, and secondly, uh, you know, we appreciate our freedoms and we know we wouldn't have them if it wasn't for people like you. So thank you so very much. God bless you on this day, your day. I used to, when I we used to call it my father who served in the Marine Corps in World War II and Korea on Veterans Day and would wish him a happy Veterans Day. I would always say, yeah, happy. This is your day, dad. And it was. And it still is, and it is all Veterans Days. So thank you so much for your service. Secondly, um, this is not what I started off to do. I, I kind of was trying to put something together that was sort of, in my mind at least, growing out of the last couple of podcasts that we did on No Room for Repentance and When Your Side Loses and some news that's been coming out, the election results, and also some other news that's been coming out about another Christian leaders like all messing up. And somehow all of that was coming together in my mind, but I couldn't quite get it together. So I don't know when and if you'll ever hear that, but uh, uh, I did make some notes on it and uh, it's just going to have to wait till it can sort of at least make some sense to me before I put it on the podcast. I've learned putting things on the podcast that make no sense at all is not usually a good idea. So there you go. So today we're going to start kind of one of our new little series that we'll be doing uh, off and on. And it deals with um, one of my favorite passages of Scripture, and that is the Beatitudes. Uh, of course, that's Matthew chapter 5, uh, verse starting in verse 2, really, and going down to verses 9, or maybe 10, depending to 12, depending on how you count them. But so let's just say the first 12 verses of the Beatitudes. Uh, of the, I'm sorry, the first 12 verses of chapter 5 of Matthew are the Beatitudes. Now, the Beatitudes. Uh, are fascinating, and um, I have looked at them and studied them and thought about them and taught on them over and over and over again for years, and it wasn't until a few years ago that I began to sort of come to my conclusion on what I think they really are, and uh, that's kind of what I want to share with you in this series on um, the Beatitudes, or as I'm calling it, a disciple's identity. So I'm just basically going off an old sermon outline of mine from about four years ago. I did a little series on this, and we're just going to kind of talk about it today and see what you think. And uh, of course, I'm always looking for your feedback. So if you have any comments or questions, whether they're good, bad, or indifferent, or if you have suggestions on future episodes, things you'd like to hear me talk about, and I'm always looking for that as all podcasters are, then uh, just uh, give me a shout. You can do it in two ways. One, you can email me, louie, L-O-U-I-E, at discipleup.org. The other is to go to our Facebook page, if you're on Facebook, facebook.com slash discipleup. You can leave your comment there. By the way, a lot of people are moving to Parler, which is a new social media site. I am on Parler. Disciple Up is on Parler. Not me personally, but Disciple Up is there. I haven't really... 
done hard anything with the account, but it is there. If you want to contact me through Parlor, go ahead. It's uh, Disciple Up on Parlor at Disciple Up. So check that out. Now let's well let's first have a drink of sun tea, and then we will jump in. It's been a busy day. I've been working from home because I was exposed to someone who was exposed to someone who had uh, COVID, who has COVID. So uh, we're just trying to be careful here. And so uh, I had a lot of time to think about this today. But like I said, what I wanted to do didn't quite work. So we're going to try something different. So let's talk then about this, because I believe what Jesus does here at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount the Beatitudes really stand out from the Sermon on the Mount. They are, well, they're unique pretty much in all biblical literature. They're, they really stand out from the rest of the sermon. And so it made, for years it made me wonder about why introduce the sermon this way? Because the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, generally speaking, is very practical, very down to earth, very in your face, and not mysterious or indirect. He's very direct. Like, you know, someone slaps you, you turn the other cheek. He wants you to go an extra mile, you go an extra mile. Here's how you pray. Our Father who art in heaven. Boom, boom, boom. But the beginning, the Beatitudes, are just the total opposite of that. They're abstract. They're indirect. They're mysterious. And uh, they sure do get your attention. And I've come to the possible conclusion that maybe what Jesus was doing here, just maybe, I mean, I can't prove this This is true, but this is kind of what I'm thinking. Maybe what Jesus is doing here, as he begins to teach this, is that he is vision casting, what we would call today vision casting, to his disciples about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 says, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. So the first thing that I want you to notice about this is this is Jesus, what I would say is vision casting. He is telling his disciples what it takes and what it means to be a disciple in what we call the Beatitudes. Now, the Bible does not call them the Beatitudes. We do because Beatitudes are a Latin word for blessing. So when you say the Beatitudes, you're just saying the blessings. But it Sounds really, you know, kind of cooler to say beatitude. Now, it is interesting that the way uh, Matthew wrote this in the Greek is when it says he went up on the mountain, he's not just, he doesn't mean just on any old mountain. It's actually the def- the definite article there. It's the mountain. It's as if, and I think this is really true, that whatever mountain Jesus preached this on, and by the way, uh, today, if you go to the Holy Lands and take uh, a tour, you will be taken to the Mount of the Beatitudes. They've built a church there, and they've got a sign there. And, of course, they have no idea if that's the hill or not. <laughs> uh, now, I've never been to the Holy Lands, and I've never taken one of those tours. And the reason why I'm not all hot and bothered to do it is because 90% at least of what you're going to see on those tours is what traditionally is identified as where the Sermon on the Mount took place or the upper room or whatever. Nobody really has any idea where these things are because they're not specifically identified. So this could have been any tall hill or mountain, if you want to use that expression, in the Holy Lands, uh, you know, in around there. But, uh, you know, if one's as good as another, I suppose. But it doesn't really matter which hill it was or which mountain it was. What matters is, is that what Jesus did when he got there. So this is the Sinai of the New Testament. And, you know, Sinai, of course, is where the law came, the Ten Commandments, which we still to this day identify as sort of the heart and soul of the Old Testament. Jesus here in the Sermon on the Mount gives out what is clearly his his first initial description and definition of a what a disciple is and what it takes to be one and secondly how disciples are supposed to live and you notice i keep saying disciples he's not talking to other people he's talking to his disciples the sermon on the mount is not meant for just anybody i mean you can of course anybody can read it and admire it and all that if you want to but it's really designed for people who have given their lives up and have chosen to follow Jesus. 
So it's really important to keep that in mind as you read the Beatitudes. So let's take a look at the first, well, verses 2 through 9. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, so here we go, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Now, you'll notice that I'm saying there the word blessed a lot. And it's interesting that it, usually if you see that word in a sentence, you'd probably say blessed. But somehow it doesn't sound right to say that when you read the Beatitudes, probably just because all your life or most of your life, in my case, since I was a young teenager in high school, when I became a Christian, I've always heard blessed and it just sounds weird to, um, you know, pronounce it any other way. So hats off to King James for that. Um, but anyway, yeah, this, now when you look at these and think about these, think about this from this, this, this kind of this new perspective that I, that I gave you, this is vision casting of what authentic disciples of Jesus are really like. All true disciples already have these characteristics to one degree or another. Now, I'm not trying to be a perfectionist here because I'm I'm neither perfect nor a perfectionist. Um, but I am saying that in your heart, these things have to be there. Now, I want you to notice some things about the Beatitudes. And again, this sets them apart from the Sermon on the Mount. There's no verbs. If you read these things, there's no verbs there. Secondly, this is all said in the third person, which again sets it apart from the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. And there's no real commands or applications here. He doesn't say, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. So you should go out there and be as merciful as you can. That's what we say when we preach on these, right? Blessed are the peacemakers. All right, let's talk about what is a peacemaker? How can we make peace? Here's what you should be doing. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Oh, here's how you can be poor in spirit, right? I mean, I've preached a jillion. Well, okay, not a jillion. <laughs> but I've preached a lot of sermons like that, and I've heard a lot more of them than I've read books that are full of stuff just like that. And, you know, most of that's it's all good stuff. I mean, it's all biblical about how to how to uh, thirst and hunger for righteousness or how to, you know, be pure in heart and all that. But you'll notice that Jesus himself doesn't do that. He simply makes these what I would call abstract statements. There's no verbs here. He's not trying to get you to do anything, at least not when he says this. Now, the rest of the Sermon on the Mount is all about doing. And boy, howdy there, he really does want you to do things. And he talks a lot about it. But in this first section, in this introduction to the Sermon on the Mount, he does not. It's pure and clear descriptive language. He's saying blessed, blessed, past tense, you'll notice, are the poor in spirit. And then he talks about the reward. There's the kingdom of heaven. Mourn, they shall be comforted. The meek, they will inherit the earth. On and on he goes. All these, all of these, uh, Persons or categories, however you want to think of it. And he describes them as persons, right? Blessed are those who. So these are people. Who are these people? Well, these people are his disciples. So these are not commands to be doing things, although you're certainly not going to harm yourself if you study this and decide, you know, I really need to be more merciful. I really need to hunger and thirst more for righteousness. And here's some ways the Bible says to do that. There's there's nothing wrong with that. That's perfectly good application. But it's not what Jesus appears to be doing when he said this originally. So it's, I'm not saying people that do this are bad or that it's heretical or that you shouldn't do it. I'm saying is go ahead and do that if you want to. That's great probably should, but at the same time, 
let's back up and let's think about original intent here. What was he trying to accomplish? Because these Beatitudes, we'll just call them that, are really a simple description of reality. He's simply describing something. When he says, the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, those who hunger and thirst, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers. And there's a reason I stopped at verse 9, and we'll get to that in a few minutes. So they're simply a description of reality. Also, if you look closely at them, I think they form a circle, which is not unusual either in Scripture. Because the first beatitude is, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is, versus, okay, or let's put it this way, the the second through the seventh beatitude is, they shall, you know, inherit the earth or whatever. And then the eighth beatitude goes back to is. Okay, that last one there is, um, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. So it's um, it's like a it's like a circle. Is exists now. Shall is a promise of something that comes at some point in the future. Now, the eighth beatitude, by the way, we haven't read yet, so that's why that statement I just made may not make sense to you, but the eighth beatitude, I'll just jump ahead for a second, is blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sakes, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Okay? So the beatitudes start and finish with is, with a lot of shalls in between. Is exists now. Shall's a promise of something that comes at some point in the future. Now, we're in the kingdom of God now. Jesus told us that. You come to Christ, you're in the kingdom. And its benefits will come to us, but I want you to note very carefully, we are not told when. Okay, We're not told when we're going to inherit the earth. And he doesn't actually define what that means. You can research that in Scripture and find out, but it doesn't say when exactly. Blessed are those who mourn, they shall be comforted. Again, it doesn't say when, it just says it will happen. You know, they shall be called the sons of God when. Well, maybe today or tomorrow, but maybe not. Maybe that won't be for a long, long time. Maybe it won't be until we're standing before our Father in heaven. Who knows? So get this the time difference there. And then the last beatitude, and the reason I held this apart from those is it's because it's different. It's repeated. And to me, it's a transitional phrase. This is transitioning from the these abstract verbless non commands into the rest of the sermon where there's going to be tons of commands <laughs> look what Jesus says in Matthew 5:10 through 12 blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven blessed are you now notice that he's breaking now he's breaking away from the way the beatitudes are structured blessed are the fill in the category. Now he's speaking directly to the people. Now he's in second person. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad. Oh, now he's telling them to do something. For your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So when I think of the Beatitudes, I think of the first 10 verses. I think of verse 11 as the transitional. This is the pivot point where he actually, verses 11 and 12, he actually lays down some application and pivots from this abstract vision casting view of what a follower of Christ is supposed to be and actually is in reality, even if it's not fully developed in our lives, into the rest of the sermon where he gets right in your face. (laughs) If you've read the Beatitudes and the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, you know how in your face he gets. Uh, You know, it's amazing some of the things people say about the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Like, oh, yeah, I live by the Sermon on the Mount. Actually, uh, President Harry S. Truman said that. Kind of makes you wonder, because I don't think Harry S. Truman was the kind of man who turned the other cheek. And he seemed to have trouble making peace with a lot of people. 
Uh, so, you know, he was a feisty, fiery kind of guy, which is, you know, that's great. But I don't know that that really <laughs> comes out of a life that's trying to be lived according to the Sermon on the Mount. That's what he said. So, and I've heard a lot of other people say that. It sounds good. Whenever I hear people say that, though, my first question that pops into my mind is, have you ever read the Sermon on the Mount? Because if you think that the way to, you know, getting to heaven or pleasing God or whatever is to live the Sermon on the Mount, there's no hope. I mean, Jesus says things in the Sermon on the Mount that are just appallingly difficult. It, You know, it's like, yeah, you shouldn't commit adultery, but if you look at a woman and lust after her, then that's the same thing as committing adultery. You've already done it in your heart, he said. So that pretty much condemns every single man who's ever lived to hell, and quite frankly, most women too, so... I mean, it the standard of, of of righteous behavior in the Sermon on the Mount is incredible. And what it does, of course, is it drives you to the grace of God because there is no way anyone can live up to the standards that Jesus sets in the Sermon on the Mount. No one. No one can. Not for long, maybe for a few minutes, an hour, if you know you're off by yourself and feeling really spiritual, but you start interacting with people much, <laughs> and you're going to have a problem. So the Sermon on the Mount's, you know, incredible, and uh, the Beatitudes which lead into it are even more amazing because they're so different from the rest of the sermon. It's just like night and day. And so I clearly, I really believe that Jesus here is trying to lay out for his disciples— that's his audience. That's who he's speaking to, even though I'm sure lots of other people were gathered and listening, but he's talking to his disciples and he's saying, here you go, boys. Bless, 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 blessed. Now, speaking of that, God's transformation of me is the real blessing. That word blessed or blessed is used 55 times in the New Testament. That's a lot. It's used of outward prosperity. It's used of God and the gods themselves. Pagan gods were used with this word attached in the Greek language. Yet it's not the common Greek word for happy, which, by the way, is not found in the New Testament. In the Bible, there's a moral and spiritual dimension to this. Clearly, there's a moral and spiritual dimension to this. But I find it fascinating that the word happy is not used in the New Testament. And this is not the common Greek word for it, although many people want to translate it that way. Uh, and, you know, you can discuss and debate the merits of that if you're really into the Greek and know your Greek scholars and all that stuff. But if Jesus meant happy, there were other words he could have used besides this word, and he did not, or Matthew didn't when he wrote it. Jesus probably spoke this in Aramaic. Matthew, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote it in Greek. So let's take a, a look at a couple of places where this word is used. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 13, and all these, uh, unless I say otherwise, these will all be all these verses will be coming from the ESV version. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, blessed or blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. All right, that's clearly a spiritual usage of the term. And God is uh, telling John in his vision that when you die in the Lord, you're blessed. Okay, that's pretty good news since all of us are going to die. So if you're going to die, you probably want to die in the Lord. John thirteen seventeen says, if you know these things, blessed or blessed are you if you do them. All right. So again, this again is a spiritual usage of the word and it's attached to obedience here. And then 1 Timothy uh, 1, 11 says, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. 
So here, Paul applies the word blessed to God himself. Now, many scholars and Bible teachers have translated this, like I said, as happy. One well-known Christian author and pastor who had a big influence on my life fairly early in my ministry in the 70s and early 80s, uh, he was also uh, chaplain of the U.S. Senate, is Lloyd John Ogilvie, and he said it should be translated, congratulations. Uh, and in fact, he had a book out on that, um, and I'm trying to remember the whole title. Congratulations was in the uh, <laughs> was in the title, but I can't remember. Um, I can't remember the name of it right now. Um, by the way, uh, Lloyd John Ogilvy died June fifth, two thousand nineteen. He was a Presbyterian minister. He had a big church in Southern California, Presbyterian, uh, the Hollywood Presbyterian Church. If, if I'm right about that. Um, Hold on. Oh, wait. No. He used the word congratulations. Uh, yes, God Believes in You. That was the name of the book, I believe. Let me look it up here. Yes, I had a copy of this. Don't need more. But uh, this was, uh, I think, the second time I preached the Beatitudes way back when. I used this book as sort of my uh, guide to that. Congratulations, God Believes in You. Clues to Happiness from the Beatitudes by Lloyd John Ogilvie. And he suggested that you translate that congratulations. So let's test both of these out. The glory of the happy God, to quote from, again, 1 Timothy 1.11, Paul says the glory of the blessed God. How about the glory of the happy God? Or the glory of the congratulated God? How about this? Happy are the poor in spirit, or congratulations, you poor in spirit. I actually prefer the word, if I was going to use either one of these, I'd use congratulations. Because um, happy, I I just, you know, the, the English word happy is derived from happenstance, which means circumstance. And um, I don't think what God's talking about here has anything to do with your circumstances, which is why he can congratulate the persecuted and he can congratulate the poor in the spirit and the mourning. Because obviously, if you're mourning, you're not happy. You might have joy and you might be blessed, but you're not happy. You, Yeah, there's no way. And if you've ever mourned, if you've ever lost a loved one or something like that, or maybe your house burned down or something, yeah, then you know what I'm talking about. So, this description then of the disciples of Jesus uses an interesting word that is very hard to translate into uh, English. I like how in the um, in the Amplified Bible they do a very interesting translation of this. And let me see if I can pull that up. I don't know if I've got... I've got this new... Yeah, I don't think I do. Hold on. Maybe I can grab it real quick. Um, do, 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 do. No, I don't see it. My new Bible study software, I'm still figuring out how to use it. I should have stuck with my old one or kept it installed anyway, and then I could jump back and forth while I'm learning Logos. But the Amplified Bible um, had tons. It had like a blessed, and then there was like a bracket, and there was all these different ways to, to understand it and translate it because it's a very deep word. It's a very rich meaning. So that's a way to sort of get your overview on this. In a sense, all of this was introduction. Now let's actually talk about one of these uh, Beatitudes, and that's, the very first one. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there shall be the kingdom of heaven. I think what this is really saying to us is that to really follow Jesus, I must abandon myself. I have to let go of myself. Now, the word poor here means extreme poverty. Not like most of us say, yeah, I'm really poor. First of all, you're not probably, most of you listening to this, really poor, even by American standards. 
And if you are poor by American standards, that still makes you pretty well off by the standards of most of the human beings that live on this planet. If you've ever been in the third world, gone into villages without power and without water, except from a well, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that gives you a whole different perspective on poverty. But this word's not talking about that. Like I've got friends in Southeast Asia and who, uh, you know, I would consider to be poor, but they're not starving to death. That's what this word means. Think of people say that you've been, you've seen pictures of people in some of these uh, refugee camps in Africa and other places that they can't get enough food and they're actually malnourished and dying. That's what poor in spirit is. Now, it's poor in spirit. It's not poor... Jesus does not say that if you're physically poor, that's a blessing. He's not talking about that. Remember, if if, if I'm right and he's vision casting and, and sort of in an abstract way describing what a disciple is, then your, your financial status is irrelevant. He's talking about where we're at spiritually, which still seems strange. Why? Would it be a good thing or a blessed thing? Why would it be something to be congratulated to be poverty-stricken spiritually? Just this. Discipleship means that I push back against our culture's selfism. We live in a culture that's all about self. It tells you to love yourself and forgive yourself and believe in yourself and boost yourself and hold on to yourself and blah, blah, blah. It's all self, 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 self. Jesus tells us right off the bat, following him is different. Following Jesus is not all about you or me or us. It's about him. In Mark 8, 34 and 35, he says, calling the crowd to him and his disciples. Notice that. So again, he's really speaking to the disciples, but there's a crowd there that can hear this. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Now, this is about as radical a departure from our culture of selfism that you can get. And it all focuses in on those two little words, deny himself. The culture says, believe in yourself, love yourself, pamper yourself, take a break. You've earned it. You deserve a break today, blah, blah, blah. That's selfism. And the American culture, more than most, although I think actually at this point it's becoming more and more spread all over the world. I see this everywhere, including in Southeast Asia. Uh, tells us that you know life is manageable if we'll just believe in ourselves, if we'll just get educated enough, blah, 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 whatever. But that's not true. Jesus is saying you need to deny yourself to follow me to take a good hard look at yourself and realize just how weak and woe be gone you really are. Because our culture says willpower. You believe in yourself strong enough and hard enough. If you love yourself enough, you can do anything. But the problem is, is that willpower becomes won't power very quickly. And if you've ever tried to lose weight or quit smoking or do anything like that, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And that's why the most widespread, well-known, and successful recovery program for drugs and alcohol, AA and all of the NA and all of those programs that use some form of the 12 steps, you will notice that the 12 steps start by telling you not to believe in yourself, but to admit things are out of control and you need help from somebody else who's bigger than you. The problem with willpower, besides the fact that it comes and goes, and now some people are very, have tons of willpower. I mean, I know some people that just are loaded with it. Other people have a lot less. It kind of depends on who you are. But ultimately, 
willpower will fail you, and Murphy's Law says it will probably do so at the worst possible time. Willpower also makes me self-absorbed. Luke 9.23, and he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him, here we go, this is Luke's version of this, deny himself. Oh no, I have to deny myself again. Yes, you do. And take up his cross daily and follow me. So I'm to deny myself, I'm to die to myself every single day and follow Jesus. Now our culture, as focused on self as it is though, does send out mixed messages on self. It tells us that we need self-esteem, we need self-love, we need self-motivation, and uh, everyone sends you, and I see this constantly in social media, all kinds of memes and things saying that you've got this, believe in yourself and everything else. And yet, at the same time that I hear all this, I also hear people saying that you have to find it yourself. People are supposed to find themselves. Well, okay. But then you hear these things and you see these things in social media as well. Things like wherever you go, there you are, and you are your biggest problem. Well, now, which is it? I can't be my biggest problem and at the same time overcome my problems by believing in me because if I believe in me and I'm my biggest problem, then I'm believing in the problem and maybe that's why I'm not making any progress. (laughs) According to the greatest leader, thinker, and teacher of all time, Jesus You need to become selfless. You need to deny yourself, not find yourself and love yourself and believe in yourself. You need to deny yourself and follow him. We need to get our focus off of ourselves. Now, see, the world and the devil who's behind a lot of this, I absolutely believe that. It's very clever because I either want to get myself focused on self as in Loving myself and, oh, I'm so wonderful. Oh, I love you so much. I heard, I, and I've mentioned this before probably, but I'll never forget years ago in a uh, community group I was involved in working with uh, trying to you know deal with drug addiction. A master's level counselor got up and said, every day you should look in the mirror and say, look into your eyes in the mirror every morning and say, I love you. <laughs> yeah. Really? When do I get to laugh? I, I, I'm sorry, that's ridiculous. But then on the other side, if you do break through that, then they want to get you focused on, well, you are your biggest problem and and blah, blah, blah. So then I'm focused on myself in a negative way. But Jesus says, no, you need to kind of move past yourself if you want to find the real answers in life and become the person God wants you to be. Jesus says, listen to your doubts when you think you can't do it because you can't. If you don't believe me, read the Sermon on the Mount. Try living up to that. Try it for one week and then email me or contact me on Parlor or get on the Facebook page if you want everybody else to see it. All two or three people that see my Disciple Up Facebook page and uh, tell me the, how well you did. But the truth is, You can't save yourself, and you can't become like Christ by yourself. Can't be done, folks. It can't be done. And the more I try to do it, the more I'm just beating myself up and pounding myself into the ground. The big problems we face in this life are far more than psychological. They're spiritual. Psychologists today, and you see this every time there's one of these mass shootings, you know, and they're talking, oh, it's evil. And you'll always have some psychologists come on uh, the television and say, there, there is no such thing as evil. This person simply has, uh, you know, dysfunction and blah, blah, blah. Well, I'm sorry to tell you this, psychologist, but you're wrong. There is something beyond the psychological, as important as that is. I'm not saying it's not important. I'm saying that the spiritual is real and it is the ultimate bedrock of all reality and there is evil. And anyone who reads history, anyone who can read history and say that evil doesn't exist, I I don't understand how you can do that. 
because it's just as plain as the nose on your face. Problems go, our problems go way beyond what we can deal with, except with God's help alone. What's the first step in AA? I mentioned AA a minute ago. What's that first step? And you'll see different versions of these steps. Sometimes they're like it's Celebrate Recovery, a great a recovery program I was involved in for many years. You know, they boiled it down to nine. Rick Warren tried to tie the 12 steps into the Beatitudes, and it worked really well for the first few steps. And then it kind of, the further you go in the nine steps or the the nine things that uh, they have in NCR the harder you have to push to make that really fit what Jesus said. But, and I've preached that too. And I, and, and I've seen it work because it's based on the simple proposition that it's all about turning to God for help. The first step in AA is we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Well, see right there, what are they doing? They're denying self. They're saying, no, the first step to recovery isn't believing in yourself. It's realizing you're not capable of doing this by yourself. Christianity is not a self-help religion or philosophy or belief system or whatever you want to call it. Christianity is about self-surrender. Christianity is about self-denial. It's about dying to ourselves and living to God. That's why Jesus kicks the Beatitudes off and this description of disciples off with, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven, which we are in right now and which will come in its fullness later, that's why he says is, because we are in it right now. If you're a believer, you're part of the kingdom. Whether you see it, feel it, believe it or not, you are. That's all about letting go of self and embracing God. About taking up your cross daily. Notice that from Luke 9 again. Let him deny himself. That's the first thing I do. Then I take up my cross daily. What does it mean to take up your cross? Well, condemned men, largely. I don't know that they ever crucified women. They probably did at one time or another, but it was very rare. But anyway, just a historical note there. Condemn people when they would take up their cross. What were they doing? Well, they were carrying usually just the cross piece, not the whole cross like you see in pictures, to the place where they were going to be crucified. It was part of the psychology that the Romans used to uh, to manipulate both the person they were about to kill and the crowd. It raised the stakes. It raised the drama. Imagine carrying on your cross your shoulders a big old 80 pound, 100 pound piece of wood that you knew in a few minutes they were going to drive nails through your wrists to attach you to that thing, lift you up, drive another spike through your feet and that you were going to hang there till you were dead. The Romans were, um, well, they were cruel to be sure. They were also masters Long before psychology was invented, they were masters at psychologically manipulating people and using that to send a message to the, to the rest, everybody that saw you, to the crowds, which is, you mess with us, this is you, so don't do it. And they walked people through the cities out to where they were going to be crucified so that everybody could see them. That's Christianity, is every day shouldering that responsibility of self-denial to follow Jesus. That's what it means to be a disciple. To me, that is the most critical part of this description. This is the one upon which all the others rest. This is the foundation of our faith. It is not self-love. It is not self-belief. It is self-denial. That's as countercultural as you're ever going to get. And yet here we are at the very beginning of the, what most people will tell you is the greatest sermon ever, even though most of them haven't read it, certainly haven't studied it, but here it is. And the first words out of his mouth are, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Blessed are those who realize they are totally impoverished spiritually, who cannot do it. There's a great and incredible blessing in that. Just as for people in recovery, when they take that first step in AA, there's the great blessing of no longer having to shoulder that burden of trying to be good enough for God. But now I shoulder a different burden. As Jesus said later, take my yoke upon you. And the yoke is self-denial and relying on God. And when I do that, that sets me free. And that sets me on the road to Christ, carrying my cross. And that's a huge part of what a disciple's identity really is. A disciple of Jesus is someone who denies themselves every single day of their lives and follows Jesus. And that's it. Selflessness, self-denial. That's our big calling card. So I hope that gives you something to think about. And it's very appropriate that I did this on today, November 11th, because service in our military, especially in combat, is as selfless as you get because there is nothing more foreign to most people than running out where other people who want to kill you can take a shot at you. And every almost every week I, I do some I do a little radio show called The Ultimate Sacrifice where I give uh, tell true stories of Medal of Honor winners and other people who sacrificed themselves to serve our country. Now they didn't all die, but many of them did. But whether they lived or died, they sacrificed, they risked it all. Not for themselves, but for a much greater cause than themselves, our country. And think about how even greater our call as disciples is to sacrifice ourselves, not for our country. No, not for our friends, not for our family, not for ourselves, but for the Lord. Doesn't get any bigger than that. That's what it means to follow Christ. And with that, I'm going to wrap it up today. I want to thank you for listening. If you're still out there listening, thank you so much. God bless you. I hope that you'll uh, share uh, with your friends about this podcast. Tell them about it. Show them how to find it. By the way, uh, this the, the lesson I just went through, I forgot to mention this, which is unusual for me, can be found. The outline that I talked about and some of the notes are available at discipleup.org. That's my website, discipleup.org. There's also links to my books there. There's links to uh, columns that I write. There's links to other video teaching. There's links to my hiking videos. There's links to everything right there at discipleup.org. So be sure and check that out. And once again, thank you so much. God bless you. Please share word of this uh, if you can. It would really mean a lot to me and would really help the podcast. So until next time, God bless you all. Take care and remember... Every time is a good time to disciple up. So long. Disciple Up, the Empowering Disciple Podcast, is written, produced, directed, in as much as there's any direction to this thing all, edited every once in a while, and paid for by Louis. It's his first ministry, and it's not connected to Christ Church on the River. CCR does not sponsor, pay for, or necessarily approve the content found therein. The theme music for Disciple Up is Hot Wheels by Varensky. Yes, Louis actually paid for the rights to this very cool piece of music, so don't worry, and please call off the lawyers, as he's busy enough without having to deal with all that. All opinions expressed during Disciple Up are Louis and Louis alone. They do not necessarily represent those of our sponsor, the Lord Jesus Christ. However, where the opinions, thoughts, impressions, and feelings shared are in line with God's Word and faithfully represent what our Lord says in His Holy Word, the Bible, then they are representative of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you're wondering how the heck you're supposed to know this, remember, God tells you to test all things. Hold on to the truth. It's up to you to do the due diligence that God commands, so do it. Don't whine about it, and don't complain about how hard it is. Don't blame me for it. Disciple up, and do what you know you're supposed to do. If you'd like to know more about Louis or Disciple Up, please go to discipleup.org and check out everything you find there. Or not, it's completely up to you. Disciple Up, the Empowering Disciples podcast will, God willing, publish an episode every week covering different areas of concern to disciples of Jesus. If that's important to you, then please subscribe on iTunes, Google, Stitcher, or another one of the many podcast aggregators available to you. If it's not, then don't. If you'd like to get in touch, please email Louis at louis at discipleup.org. God bless you.